Thank you, Caitlin. It's very, it is an absolute, absolute honour to be here today. And I see a couple of familiar faces out there. So, hello, everyone. Love you heaps. Um, gee, this, I've realised how short I am. Because this is a big pool. Oh, good, I got an extra. Fantastic. Great. Thank you so much. Now, I just want to thank uh, Pastor Christine for the, just the honour and privilege it is to speak to you wonderful people today. Of course, Pastor Peter, but because he's a man, I didn't know whether to mention him or not because, you know, it's a women's conference. So, um, But no, I'd love to thank the Breakthrough family. They are just the most precious people to us. We They're the most faith-filled, wonderful people. And if I start talking about Caitlin or Brooke, I will cry. So I love them too. So just a little intro about me. I'm just going to walk over here so you can see. This is how tall I am. And uh, just over this side too, so that because this is this is all of me almost. Um, I am obviously have got a beautiful family, and one of them was up here. Oh, he's gone. Uh, he's the drummer. So I have got two beautiful children: my daughter Emily and my son Evan. Of the back there, Jay's waving like he's my son. They're the same person. If you've met Jay and Evan together, they literally are the same person born in different families. Um, and I'm married to a gorgeous man, Craig, who's at another church event today. We've been involved with Planet Shakers Church since about, well, actually, since it started. And we came over with them and have been ministering there for years. I'm a teacher. I'm a wife. I love Jesus. And this is just an absolute honour to speak today on this incredible scripture. So thank you again. Can we just give a clap for these beautiful pastors, for Christine and Peter? They're just the most faithful amazing people so I should start by praying I've just got to fess up here this is only my second gig so you know I, I do do a lot of talking and I do speak a lot but um you know this is such an honor for me to to preach to you today so let's just start by praying hey Father, I want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity to speak about your word. Father, we thank you for your word. God, it brings life and liberty and freedom to us. And Father, as I speak today, I pray that it would impact us deeply, that we would walk away changed by your word today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, I'm going to start with a very non um sort of non-feminine topic for a, you know, women's conference and that's got a bit of an aviation theme. I don't know if anyone's a pilot out there but I'm married to one. So pilotisms have become a major part of my life. So these little sayings that my husband uses all the time, he's quite quirky my husband, and he uses these sayings and one of them is this saying that he uses which he says, handing over, like if someone needs to take over something, he'll say handing over. And then the other person has to say, I have control, okay? So it's like a call and response, very Anglican actually. Handing over, the other person has to say, I have control. So this started in earnest when we had our first children. So we would, you know, I'd be driving the pram. Driving a pram, wow, prams are weird, right, when you first get going on them. And so, you know, I'd be doing this pram and I'd go, handing over, handing over. And he'd taking, I have control, he'd take over. Feeding children, I mean feeding children. If you ever want to hand something over, hand over feeding a toddler. You know, be doing the aeroplane, very aviation themed. And, you know, there'd be food everywhere as there always is. Handing over, he'd say, I have control. I don't think really anyone had control at that point. Nappy changing, always a really good one to hand over. Handing over, I have control. Anything really that you don't want to do, really, hand over and that person has control. So we would say this all the time. You know, I'm assuming having never flown a plane, thank the Lord, uh, I'm not really great with lots of buttons or memory things, but um, that this sort of little saying, which sounds fun, is, has quite serious connotations. Obviously, it's direct language. It leaves no doubt. Handing over, I have control. Someone else has control. It leaves nothing in doubt. It's not like, well, I'll let you have a little go for five minutes and then I'm going to come back and just, you know, see how you're going. I might take that back because I don't really know if I can trust you. It's not vague. It leaves nothing in doubt. Handing over, I have control. You know, you see in our natural lives, we don't want to hand over control. Our nature is not destined to do that. It's not designed to do that. Our human flesh wants to always have control. You know, a great example of this human nature in a raw state is toddlers. Now, if there is the epitome of flesh incarnate, 
It's a toddler. Anyone had a toddler out there? Anyone seen a toddler? Anyone has a toddler at the moment? I don't have it at the moment, but thank you, Jesus. Toddlers literally are that expression of what our flesh, our human nature wants to do. It wants to have control. There's this story of when I was driving in my car to a playground in Warrandyte. Great playground in Warrandyte. Although I was there the other day and they're knocking it down. Anyway, I don't know why. Great playground with my daughter who's now 20. So this was quite a while ago. She was probably 18. Or she was 18. She wasn't 18 when I was driving her. She was two. So 18 years ago. Driving. You know, and I said, we're going to this great place. It's going to be fantastic. You'll love it. And the thing about toddlers is for some reason shoes become the challenge of their life. I don't want to wear shoes. I want to take them off at the most inappropriate times. So I'm driving along and I had these great pink rubber shoes that I used to have on Emily. They were cheap. They were like the original Crocs, but they stuck on her chubby little toddler feet. They were fantastic. So I had these shoes on her. So I said, right, keep your shoes on. So we're going to get the playground. We'll get out and we'll have fun and all this sort of thing. Anyway, I start to hear this <coughs> noise in the back seat. You know, that rub of rubber along chubby toddler flesh. And I said, Emily, do not take off your shoes. So silence. I thought, look at me. Perfect mother. First time obedience, there it is. Look at that. I mean, it's amazing. Until about a few seconds later, I hear that same noise with a little bit more urgency. Ah, 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 You know, Emily, do not take off your shoes. Now, it could have gone either way here. My confidence around my first time obedience was maybe slightly slipping at that point. And I knew within seconds that it had gone completely when this pink rubber shoe comes flying over my head, hits the front, you know, windscreen, bounces around the steering wheel, falls to the ground. I will have control. Toddlers want control. They want control. She did find out fairly soon that who was in control, but that's another story. Handing over control to someone else is not our natural response. Our human nature wars against someone else having control. And, you know, this began in the first garden. So we're going to talk about this garden right now to start off. In Genesis 3, verse 1 to 5, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, And also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. What does our human nature strive to do? Take control. Why? Because in that very first garden, man took control and they didn't trust God. And they doubted him and sin entered into the world. You know, we all struggle to trust God. This is what this conference is about, this beautiful afternoon, talking about trusting God. You know, our human nature wars against the fact that we forget that God is always good. It's a struggle. I'm going to be honest with you today. This is a struggle. We all struggle with this. We war against that human nature that says, but God didn't come through. He didn't answer the way I thought he would answer. And we wrestle with this control and trust. We say, maybe God, well, you could just maybe turn the reading light on in the flight deck. That would help me. Just a little thing. You know, press that button that means do nothing. It does nothing. Or maybe, you know, just adjust the seat for me. We remember when we thought he failed us or that he didn't answer us in the way that we wanted. And that determines our level of trust. You know, we can even do as the world did in the last few years when everything goes awry and we're locked down. Instead of trusting God and giving him full control, we put our Christmas trees up early. We make sourdough bread. I didn't, but anyway, I tried. Think I thought about it. We get fit or we get fat. Either way, 
This is because of the banana bread that we've been eating, lots of it. Or we post everything on Instagram that we do in our lockdown state. And when we have the choice to come back to church, we choose to watch it online. Do we give over that control? You know, many times in my life, and I'm sure in yours, this challenge of trusting God and handing over has been the choice we've faced. And I wish I could say, as the great woman of faith, every time I was faced with a challenge, I said, hand him over. I trust you completely, Lord. I'm probably the only one here that's done that. But I don't. I waver. I wobble. But I can tell you that the strength that is found in our weakness at that moment of trust, is so powerful. Because there is great freedom when we step into that. I will hand over to you. No matter what it looks like, God, I choose to hand over to you. We are called to be different. You've given up your Saturday afternoon to look at Proverbs 3. You are called to be different. Because you are called to be women who trust in God who have chosen to say, I will go and I will invest in understanding what it is again to trust because he is a faithful God. He is trustworthy. He is kind. He is loving. He is unshakable. These are the characteristics of the God we know. He is never fails us. He is good and faithful and he is a good, good father. He loves you. And that is why he can be trusted when we choose to hand over. So let's have a look at this scripture. It's taken me a little while to get there. So let's have a look at this beautiful scripture. It is beautiful. And I love that Pastor Christine had a word about this, Proverbs 3, verse 5. And I'm looking at the first one, verse 5. So let's remember the character of God as we begin to look at this. So Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. From that moment in the first garden onwards, trust in God became our choice. At that moment, it was our choice. So let's have a look. Trust in the Lord. What does this look like? Now, I'm no Bible scholar. All my family are Bible college students. I might have met. My son, my daughter are both in Bible college. My daughter works for the church. My husband's got doing his master's. They're all very Bible college people. Um, me, I actually have a little bit of a, I've had a, I've had time at Bible College because my mum was the secretary of the Bible College in Adelaide and she used to give me the application forms for all the new young men that were coming into the Bible College. I can't believe I'm admitting this. I'm going off my notes here. But if you're looking for a husband, she used to shortlist a group for me and I would come in, you know, this was obviously early 90s, probably, yes, yes, it was early 90s. And there would be this, you know, mum would go, oh, here's a bunch of good ones, you know, back in the day before electronics, you know, and you'd, I'd look through and I'd go, oh, he's lovely, you know, and we'd shortlist guys. Anyway, that's sort of an aside. That's my experience with Bible college was, and it worked quite well. I mean, I married my husband. He was one of the shortlisted ones. My mum loved him. So we're, there you go. So 1995, fantastic. It works. So you never know. Bible college can be used for multiple ways. They do call it bridal college for a reason sometimes. So let's have a look at this back to Hebrew word meaning, much more important. The Hebrew word for trust here means refuge, to be confident or sure, to trust, to have a careless confidence in. I, I know a little bit about this because, you know, I've listened to my family talk about it, but the last letter of this word, this Hebrew word, represents the presence of God. So basically what that trust word is, says, it says taking refuge in the presence and covering of God. You know, each word in the Hebrew defines its own self. It's so beautiful. It's this thought of refuge, trust being a dwelling place with God. You know, I want you not to look at trust as a struggle. Sometimes we look at it as, I've got to, I've got to do. It's not a struggle. This should be a place of rest. This should be a place of refuge in God's presence. Imagine that place where you feel completely safe, where you just feel covered where you just know the rest that is yours, that's trust. That's what this scripture is saying. Trust, find refuge, confidence in his presence, in his covering around us, those arms of Jesus that we lay back in when we need to trust. 
You know, I want to encourage you next time you feel that fear. We all feel it. Come under his refuge. Trust him. When that word trust comes to your head, think, I'm going to go in refuge in my, my father, in my saviour's arms. His presence, his covering. You know, the challenge here is to make the choice to join our thinking to the character of God by remembering his faithfulness, our refuge when we choose to trust. This is a real challenge, though, still, isn't it? Because we go through journeys of trust, some more intense than others. Our whole life is a walk of faith and trust. But there are seasons where we journey through something that is so challenging. And this thought of trusting in the middle of it. You know, I don't know about you. You might be in the middle of a trust journey. I know I am. What do we do in the middle when you're trying to find refuge in the middle of that trust journey? There's this beautiful story, and I just love the Bible. I love his word. It's just so rich. But in Joshua 4, verse 5 to 9, I'll just read it. Joshua says to the priest, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of Israel to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took the 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, as the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been taken from the middle of the Jordan on the spot where the priests who had carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. You know, Joshua called these 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites and commanded them to take the stones from the middle of the Jordan to build a memorial. Building a memorial is such a beautiful picture. I love the beautiful moments in the Old Testament where there are memorials to the faithfulness of God. And you would have them in your own life. There are times where you say, Lord, what a memorial that was. That's a memorial to you for faithfulness. That's a memorial to your faithfulness. This is what he was getting them to do. We need to build a memorial. We're crossing over into that promised land. We've come from Egypt and all of those challenges of the 40 years in the desert. And we're crossing over in the Ark of the Covenant. The waters parted just as they had at the Red Sea in the Jordan. And they walked over on dry land. And he says to them, take a stone from the middle of the Jordan. Joshua wanted the people to remember the faithfulness of God. But what is the significance of taking a stone from the middle? I don't know about you, but that's the hardest place. Is that the hardest place to pick a stone up from? You know, you get to the other side of the Jordan, you go, yes, great, quick, let's gather some stones. We haven't had to carry them. They're here already. Let's build it up. No, what Joshua was doing was so much more powerful. He said, come, take them from the middle. You're not over yet. You're in the middle of the Jordan. Pick up those stones. He said, pick up a stone from that place of wrestle, from that struggle, from the place in the middle. Find the power of remembering his faithfulness when you didn't have the answer. The trial wasn't over But they picked those stones up and they carried them for that last section, knowing they would be a memorial, but they took them from the middle. I don't know if you're in the middle, but the promise ahead of you is so amazing. The memorial that you will set up is so incredible. But what God's calling you to do is pick up a stone now. What's in the middle of your struggle is such a testimony at the end. Pick it up in the middle. Find refuge in his faithfulness and trust him even in the middle. Pick that stone up and carry it to the end. The second part of this scripture, is this okay? Great. 
Okay. <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I love this little bit at the end. You know, this section puts its finger on our heart. You know, our heart sometimes robs us of the trust we can find in God, our emotions and our heart. That's why the scripture in Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. We need to guard our heart so that things don't get in the way of trusting the Lord. Guard your heart. I've got this random gun story, very unfeminine again. But this is a, you know, I went to an agricultural high school in Adelaide. Anyone been to an agricultural high school? No? I learned how to shear sheep and castrate rams. Sorry, boys. <laughs> really important things that really helped right now with what I'm doing. Not at all. But I used to go out onto lots of farms with all the my friends in high school and, you know, learn how to drive manual cars and do donuts in, you know, all sorts of places and... And learn how to shoot a gun. Amazing. Never used that either since. But we, you know, set up these hay bales and pieces of paper. And I had no idea what I was doing. But obviously these boys would shoot rabbits all the time. So, you know, we had these 22 rivals and we're laying there. And I'm, they're teaching me how to, you know, shoot. And the first thing they taught me was a safety cap. A guard. So that the gun wouldn't go off. They said, Vonnie... Keep this guard over. Okay, keep it over. I said, no problems. I can follow instructions. No, I can't. <laughs> so, you know, I had a couple of goes and then I remember my friend got up to walk. Now, this doesn't end badly. Okay, just so you know, I did not shoot anyone. Nearly. But um, so, you know, he went to go and check on how badly I'd been shooting, which was pretty bad. And I hadn't put the safety catch on that guard. And the gun went off, hit the ground a couple of metres behind him. You know, just, I went, ooh. <laughs> he just went, that was the last time I held a gun. So, but it's that thought of guarding your heart. Guard your heart. Because we have to stop the enemy from attaching disappointment to our spirit. When we think God hasn't come through the way he's come through, then we go, oh, it's attached. No, guard it. Cut it off. Break it off. Whatever that thing is, God has a good plan for our lives. His word is faithful. He is faithful to us. He knows he has a plan and he's going to work it out. So it doesn't matter what it looks like. Guard against that disappointment. Your heart is so important. And that's why it says trust in the Lord with all your heart. Guard it. Keep it soft. How do we do this? We spend time in his presence. You know, we choose to praise him when our heart starts to deceive us, when our emotions start to take over, we choose to praise him. Because what praise does is it shifts our attention. It shifts our mentality. It shifts our mindset to something so much greater. And the enemy has no authority when we choose to lift up the name of Jesus. We put our eyes and attention on him and we say, I will praise you. I know it looks bad, but I will praise you because you are worthy of praise. You are worthy of all my honor and adoration because you, God, your faithfulness remains the same. Your character never changes. You are God Almighty and I will choose to praise you. Take refuge in the covering and protection of God because you remember what God did for you. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Force yourself to praise. You know, there have been, there've been times in our lives, so many times as a family where we have just got up and we've walked up and down. And I'd encourage you to do this with your kids. And your family. And if you're on your own, just do it. 
get up, walk up and down in your house and say, I will praise you, Jesus. I will praise you, Jesus. I choose to lift you up. I choose to put you above this. I choose to praise you, not for any other reason. You're not changing to force God's hand. You're changing, you're praising because he's worthy, because he's worthy of all honor and praise, because he deserves our praise. So praise him when it's hard. Praise him when you don't feel like your heart has reason to, because it protects your heart as you choose to put your attention on him. Praise breaks the struggle. It changes it. So let's have a look at this next section. Trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Do not lean. So look at, let's look at this word lean. You know, the Hebrew word again for lean here says to support oneself to lie, to rely, rest, put your full weight on. The scripture is telling us to not put our full weight on our own understanding, our own thinking. But by extension, it's saying, put your full weight on God. So in true teacher form, I'm going to get you to all stand up because, you know, it's halfway through, so we need to stretch. So do you want to just stand up? If you can. If you're cuddling a baby, don't worry. All right, now I want you just to sit down again. So what did you just do then? You just put your full weight on a chair. I didn't see any of you go, oh my goodness, this is still here. Let me just check. I'm not quite sure. I'm not going to sit down. She's told me to sit down. I will not put my full weight on something I have not seen. Have we tested this? This is a thought. When we choose to trust, when we choose to put our full weight on something, we don't hesitate like you do with this chair. We just go, no, I trust him. I trust him. You just sat down on that chair made by man. Great comfy chairs, by the way. Much better than at my church. And We really need to get chairs like this. But you put your full weight. That's what it is. When you sit down, every time you sit down, anytime, I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to say, trust me. Just a little thought. Put your full weight on me. Your full weight. Not just a little bit of it. I didn't see any of you just, none of you have got those great quads, you know, where you're just holding yourself above. I can't see any of you doing that at the moment. It's just like, I'm not quite sure. I'll just put a toe there. I'm not going to trust this completely. No, put your full weight. That's what this scripture is saying. It says, don't put it on your understanding or your heart because it deceives, deceives you. Put your full weight on God. You know, our understanding is flawed, as we've seen, like in that first garden. They put their full weight on their own understanding, said they doubted God. I don't know, God. Do you really know? We need to understand the power in our God and in the name that is above every name. The Old Testament always points to Jesus. And this verse tells us not to trust in our own understanding, but to fully lean on the faithfulness and character of God, who was the example of this in human form, Jesus. When we faced with handing over our trust to God, the key is knowing in whose name we put our trust. The power of the name of Jesus. This is that thought as you sit, say, I trust you, God, because your name is above every name. Let's have a look at this great story. I love this in Luke 18, verse 35 to 42. Caitlin, you have to wave at me if I'm going over, okay? I think I'm okay, good, okay. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want from me? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. 
You know, in this passage, Jesus is called by two names. The first one is the crowd. Jesus of Nazareth. They called him by his earthly name, the place where he came from. They associated him with just a place. They didn't associate him with any power. He's just from Nazareth. You know, Mary and Joseph's son. He's been around. Jesus of Nazareth. But I want you to think about this bit. The blind man. He's blind. He can't see Jesus. He can't see him in the natural or he can't see him in the natural. The blind man calls out Jesus, son of David. Have mercy on me. What is that name? That's his messianic title. That's his supernatural name. He says, I recognize the power in your name. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he keeps calling out. They tried to quiet him. No, you don't understand. He's just from Nazareth. No, he understood the name of Jesus. Jesus, son of David. And what did Jesus do when someone called on his supernatural title? Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. How amazing. You know, later in Scripture, there's a story about how Jesus went back to his own town and it says they didn't recognize him. They didn't recognize his name. They associated him with Nazareth. And it says a shocking Scripture that always challenges me and he did not do many works there. They didn't recognize who he was. They didn't understand the power that is in that name. I wonder what names have been spoken over your journey right now. What are those names? We've all got them in our head. What are the words that have been spoken over our lives? Do you know there's a name that's above every name? Oh, Jesus, son of David. Jesus, son of David, name above every name. You are more powerful. You are more mighty. And I will put my trust in that name, the name that is above every name. You know, those names need to bow, those words over our lives, because there is a name that is above every name. I want to encourage you that there is a beautiful story beautiful picture of what it looks like to be down in the middle of the struggle. Just before I get there, I just want to talk about this whole thought. When you're calling on the name of Jesus, that moment where you call on his name and praise him. When you're in a struggle or in a journey of trust, which we all are, whatever it looks like, People are watching. You know, it reminds me of this story where Paul and Silas obviously were in the prison. We know that one. Great story. And they're in the prison. And they start to praise Jesus while they're in chains. And they start to praise and they lift up the name of Jesus. And they begin to praise and they begin to praise and they begin to praise. And the chains fall off. And they don't leave. They stayed there. Why did they stay there? Because it says the jailer saw it, was about to take his own life because they thought, he's, he said, I'm going to be killed because of this. But they stayed and kept praising. They said, don't worry, we're still here. They praised and that jailer saw that they chose to praise in the middle of their circumstance and he and his whole family were saved. Who's watching you? Who's watching you? Is it your children? Is it your spouse? Is it your friends? Is it your workmates? Is it other people around you who don't know Jesus who are looking at you in a struggle and saying, how can they possibly praise? How can they call on the name of Jesus? We have to be countercultural in this world. We have to choose to be different. Because then how do we witness if in the middle of those journeys we choose to allow our heart to get disappointed, we shrink back from our faith, we choose not to trust? 
Whatever the outcome, he is faithful. He is just. He is true. Remember that refuge. When we find refuge in him, and they say, how are you at peace in this? How are you at peace? Because you're choosing to praise and people are watching you. They are watching you lift your hands in the middle of your praise journey. They are watching you carry those stones. They are watching you in the middle as you walk towards the conclusion. And they're saying, how? Because of Jesus. Because of the name above every name. Because I know the Saviour. I want to just finish with this last beautiful picture. You know, I started with the first garden, but there's a second garden. And this is a beautiful garden. This is the picture of what it means to be down in the middle of a battle. You see, you know this one. We all know this one. It's cold. It's dark. It's lonely. Jesus was praying, great sweating great drops of blood on his knees in the garden. Let's read in Matthew. It says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to the place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. As I finish this this sermon, I want us to think about that moment of Jesus in the garden, on his knees, with his face down alone, in the middle. He knew his father. He knew the power in his his father. He knew the faithfulness of his God. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus handed over his full trust to God, his whole life, his will, his authority, his future, his perfection. He handed everything over to God. He put his full weight on God. He chose to hand over his perfect life so that we could have eternal life free from sin. Jesus was handing over his trust alone in the garden so we would never have to be alone. These moments, where Jesus did these things. He did it so we wouldn't have to do it alone. He knelt in that garden. He said, I hand over my trust to you, Lord, alone. His disciples couldn't even stay awake. He handed over alone so we would never, ever have to be alone in our trust. You are not alone. Because Jesus has done it already for you. He handed over perfection in every way. Perfect heart. Perfect understanding. Perfect reliance on God. He handed over perfection so we would never have to be perfect in our trust. We would never have to do that because he's done it for us. Because Jesus stands with us, we can trust God with all our heart. He is with you. He stands giving strength and power so that you can trust completely and put your full weight 
on God, who will never let you fall because Jesus bought our freedom and trust forever. At that moment in the garden, he replicated that moment in the first garden, but in perfection he handed back. Handed it all back to God. He said, I give it all back for the salvation of your people because relationship with us was more important to Jesus and God than anything. He knew we wouldn't do this perfectly, so he did it in perfection so we wouldn't have to. He knew we wouldn't be able to do it completely, so he did it completely. So we all just need to trust and rest in his faithfulness. He gave us the ultimate picture of his faithfulness, of God's faithfulness to his people by sacrificing his very son so we could trust him forever. So today, Breakthrough Women, we're going to just do a small act of trusting you know, he stands giving us strength and power so that you can completely trust, put your full weight on God who will never let you fall because Jesus did it for us. As Jay plays so beautifully in the background there, I want us just to take a moment to hand over again Handing over God. And he's going to say, I have control. Why does he say, I have control? Because he's the great I am. He is the great I am. His name is more powerful. You can trust him in the handover. You can trust him with your heart. You can put your full weight on him. You can choose to praise in the middle because he is faithful. So I want us just to have that moment where we stand. And if the fans, oh, oh yes. Oh, it's so good, aren't they? Great. Didn't even notice. As we just sing this song, I want us to stand. If you want to just say, Lord, I give it to you again. Handing over, Lord. I choose to trust you. If I'm in the middle or I'm at the end or I'm showing someone what it's like, I choose to trust you. And as Caleb leads us in this song, let's just trust him. Let's give him our full way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. It's the sound of your praise, your glorious grace. Wherever I stand, wherever I stand my soul celebrates. This be your song. This is my song. Sound of your praise, your glorious grace. Wherever I stand, my song. Celebrate one more time. It's my song. This is my song. This is the sound rising up from me. It's my. It's the sound of your praise. I just want to pray for a couple of things specifically. And, you know, Pastor Christine and I'll minister later individually. But if you're in the middle, if you're in the middle of that walk, if you're in the middle of your Jordan, if you're struggling to step to lean over and pick up that stone if you're in the middle. I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me when I was preparing. 
this sermon. If you're in the middle, he wants to encourage you. You see, they did it with 12 of them. All of them together. It's a picture of Jesus' 12 disciples or in a group, in community. We do it together. We do it because we're part of his kingdom. We do it because Jesus did it alone so we wouldn't ever have to. So if you're struggling in the middle, if you're finding it hard in the middle, we all do. I'd love you to raise your hands because women of God around you are going to be the other 12. They're going to put their hands on you. They're going to say, we will stand with you. So if you're in the middle and you're struggling, I want you to raise your hands where you are. And beautiful breakthrough women, I'd love you to lay your hands on those around you and begin to pray. Lord, give them strength in the middle. Give them strength in the middle. And as you raise your hands, praise him. Choose to praise him. Name above every name. You have the authority and power. Raise your hands if you need that in the moment. If you're in the middle and you need someone to stand beside you, put your hands up and let us just gather around as we sing this again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just got one more, is that okay? I felt as we were, as I was speaking in that section about the name that is above every name, that there are some names or words that have been spoken over your life that need to come under the authority of the name that is above every name. You see, we know his name. We know his messianic title. Good word, hey? We know it. We know the supernatural power that is in his name. And so I know because we've all had them. I've had names spoken over me. And they have to bow to the name that's above every name. And time and time again, I've seen them come under the authority of the name that is written over my name. Because Jesus wrote it over my name. He is the name that is above every name. And so we're just going to do a tiny little bit more. For the last time as Caleb sings this, I want you to raise your hands and say, I give you that name. I give you that name. Whatever it is, if it's sickness, if it's something that's come against you, if it's a hurt, Give that name to Jesus and say, I will praise you. So as we sing this last bit, let your words, your praise of the name that is above every name, break the power over every name that has been spoken over you. So Jesus, we break the power of those names right now over our own lives. We break them because they have no authority. They must come under the power of the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus.